Hey there, you know those deep dives you love? Well, get ready, because we're about to unpack the 2022 Nobel Peace Prize. And let me tell you, this one, it's all about the power of everyday people making a real difference. It's incredible, isn't it? Alfred Nobel, way back when, he envisioned this prize as a way to celebrate those pushing for peace between nations. Pushing for peace, yeah. And you know, while armies and treaties might grab the headlines, this year's winners, well, they remind us that real change often starts at the grassroots. Absolutely. This year, it wasn't about a single peace treaty or some major political figure. It was about recognizing the courage of individuals and organizations working tirelessly often behind the scenes, to defend human rights and challenge those in power. It's about understanding that peace, well, it isn't just the absence of war, right? It's the presence of justice. Yeah. And sometimes achieving that means confronting some uncomfortable truths. And that's exactly what makes the stories of our 2022 laureates, Ailis Bailatsky Memorial and the Center for Civil Liberties, so incredibly compelling. They remind us that we don't have to be diplomats or world leaders to fight for a more just and peaceful world. You've got that right. Each laureate, in their own way, has chipped away at oppression, shining a light on human rights abuses, and giving a voice to those who have been silenced. Giving a voice that's powerful. It is. Let's start with Ailis Bailatsky, a name synonymous with human rights in Belarus. Oh, absolutely. You might think a leading figure like him would come from a political background, but get this, he was a literary scholar. It's fascinating how life takes these unexpected turns, isn't it? Bialyatsky's journey from the world of literature to becoming a human rights champion shows us that courage, while it can bloom in the most unexpected places. And it was the darkening political landscape of Belarus in the 1990s that pushed him to act. Yeah, imagine this. The Soviet Union collapses, and instead of newfound freedoms, Belarus seems to be slipping back towards authoritarianism. That's when Bialyatsky steps in, founding Vyazna, which, and this is so fitting, translates to spring. In Belarusian. It really is. Vyazna became this beacon of hope, a testament to the enduring human spirit that yearns for freedom, even in the face of oppression. And their work was crucial. Okay, so what did Vyazna actually do? Paint us a picture. Imagine being wrongfully imprisoned, subjected to torture, simply for voicing your opinion. That was the reality for many in Belarus. Vyazna documented these abuses, meticulously gathering evidence, giving a voice to the voiceless. They provided support to the families of political prisoners, ensuring that those who were, in the sense chills down my spine, disappeared, were not forgotten. It's like they were building a fortress of truth, brick by brick, with each documented case. And the Belarusian government, they weren't too happy about it, right? Not one bit. Bialyaski became a target. He was arrested multiple times, imprisoned, constantly harassed, you name it. But you know what's amazing? None of that could break his spirit. It really shows the depth of his conviction. It's remarkable, isn't it? This unwavering commitment to human rights. Yeah. Talk about putting your own freedom on the line for the sake of others. He knew that shining a light on these abuses, documenting them for the world to see, was often the only way to hold those in power accountable. It takes incredible strength to stand up to that kind of pressure. It makes you realize that defending human rights isn't just about, you know, words on paper. It's about real people taking very real risks. Absolutely. And speaking of taking risks, our next laureate, Memorial, knew a thing or two about that. Their story, it's deeply intertwined with Russia's history, particularly its struggle to come to terms with, well, let's just say the darker chapters of its past. Now, Memorial was actually founded back in 1987 when the Soviet Union was still around. Can you imagine the guts it took to start digging into the horrors of Stalin's regime right under the noses of the authorities? It was an act of incredible bravery. You see, Memorial understood that true peace requires more than just, you know, laying down arms. It demands confronting the ghosts of the past, acknowledging the atrocities that were committed, and ensuring they're never repeated. They were basically saying, let's bring all this dirty laundry out in the open, air it out so we can finally start to heal. Exactly. And they didn't start with the collapse of the Soviet Union. In fact, their work became even more crucial as Russia transitioned to a new era. They started documenting human rights abuses in post-Soviet Russia, including the Chechen Wars, which... That was a whole other beast altogether. Now, for those who might not be familiar with that chapter, the Chechen Wars were brutal conflicts in the 1990s and early 2000s. Think of a region grappling with independence, caught in a tug of war between different factions, and you start to get a picture of the chaos. It was a powder keg of ethnic tensions, separatist movements, and, well, let's just say a heavy-handed response from the Russian government. And within that volatile environment, 
Memorial was one of the few voices brave enough to document these choices happening on all sides. They were stepping on landlines, metaphorically speaking, right? I mean, challenging official narratives, especially when it comes to war, incredibly risky business. You're exactly right. They were threatened, harassed, and tragically, they even lost one of their own. In 2009, Natalia Estimarova, who headed Memorial's office in Chechnya, was murdered. Just awful. It's horrifying, and it reminds us how dangerous it can be to stand up for what's right, especially when powerful forces are determined to silence dissent. It's a stark reminder of the risks that human rights defenders face every single day, but it also speaks volumes about the importance of their work, you know. Memorial refused to be intimidated into silence because they understood that silence only benefits the perpetrators. And it wasn't just physical violence they had to contend with. Remember that foreign agent label we talked about? The one used to discredit and silence organizations critical of the government? Yeah, Memorial got slapped with that too. It was a blatant attempt to stifle their work, to discredit them in the eyes of the public. And ultimately, in 2022, it led to their forced closure by the Russian authorities. Can you imagine the utter devastation? Decades of meticulously collected documents, testimonies, all at risk of being lost or destroyed. Talk about a blow to historical memory. It was a huge loss. Those archives, they weren't just pieces of paper. They were evidence of the human cost of oppression, a testament to the resilience of the human spirit. And a stark warning for the future. They remind us that we can't just bury the past and pretend it never happened. Because if we don't learn from history, we're doomed to repeat it, right? Correct. Right. 100%. So we've talked about the courage of an individual with Alice Bieliotsky, the power of collective memory with Memorial. But our third laureate, the Center for Civil Liberties, CCL, well, they take us on a slightly different path. While Bieliotsky and Memorial were primarily focused on their respective countries, CCL had a broader vision right from the start. Yeah, CCL was all about building a democratic society in Ukraine from the ground up. And they weren't afraid to get their hands dirty, so to speak. Right. They were out there educating people about their rights, pushing for government reforms, empowering citizens to hold their leaders accountable. They recognize that building a just and peaceful society, it isn't just about lofty ideals. It's about the nitty gritty work of making those ideals a reality. So they're laying the groundwork, putting in the sweat equity, and then bam, 2013 hits and Ukraine is thrown into turmoil with the Euromaidan protests. Talk about a baptism by fire. These protests were a pivotal moment in Ukraine's history. It started with the government backing out of a deal with the European Union, but it quickly escalated into a full-fledged pro-democracy movement with people demanding greater transparency, accountability, and an end to corruption. And CCL, they were right there in the thick of it, weren't they? Absolutely. They launched their Euromaidan SOS initiative, which was basically a rapid response to the escalating violence and human rights abuses happening during the protests. Imagine trying to document every instance of violence, every disappearance in the middle of that chaos. It was a monumental task. They were collecting evidence, providing legal aid to victims, even creating interactive maps to track the disappearances of activists and journalists. Sounds like something out of a spy thriller. In a way, it was. They were playing this incredibly dangerous game of cat and mouse with the authorities, gathering information that would later prove to be crucial in holding those responsible for the violence accountable. So they're in the midst of this incredibly volatile situation, trying to build a democracy while dodging, you know, metaphorical and maybe even literal bullets. And then, as if things weren't complicated enough, Russia annexes Crimea in 2014 and the war in Donbass erupts. Yeah, talk about a major plot twist. It completely reshapes CCL's focus. Remember how I said they were building a house in a hurricane? Well, now the hurricane had intensified. They became one of the first human rights groups to send monitoring teams into these conflict zones. Talk about a crash course in crisis management. I mean, one minute you're focused on democratic reforms and the next you're documenting war crimes. It was a complete shift in gears. And remember, this was happening against a backdrop of rampant misinformation and propaganda. You had different narratives flying around each side, trying to control the story. And CCL's meticulous documentation cut through all that noise like a laser beam. They were providing the world with a much needed reality check, showing the human cost of this conflict. Exactly. And their work became even more crucial after Russia's full-scale invasion in 2022. Suddenly the world was watching, but there was still so much confusion about what was really happening on the ground. And CCL was thrust onto the front lines of this information war, documenting atrocities, gathering evidence of potential war crimes, all while bombs are dropping around them. 
It's hard to even fathom the kind of courage that takes. It's mind-blowing, isn't it? They were risking their lives to make sure these stories were heard. These crimes were reco recorded so that those responsible could be held accountable. Their work is a powerful testament to the idea that even in the darkest of times, there are those who refuse to let the truth be silenced. And that's what connects all three of our 2022 Nobel Peace Prize laureates, Ailes Bialyatsky Memorial and the Center for Civil Liberties. They each faced incredible challenges, incredible risks, and yet they persisted. They remind us that peace isn't something that just happens. It's something that's fought for, often at great personal cost. It's about individuals and organizations standing up and saying, no more. We will not stand idly by while human rights are violated. We will document. We will speak out. We will demand justice. Their stories are both inspiring and sobering. It's easy to feel overwhelmed by the sheer scale of the problems in the world, the wars, the human rights abuses. But then you hear about people like Bialyatsky, like the folks at Memorial and CCL, and you realize that even amidst all the darkness, there are flickers of hope, everyday heroes fighting for a better world. And that's the real takeaway here, isn't it? Yeah. It's not about feeling powerless or hopeless. It's about recognizing that each of us has a role to play in building a more just and peaceful world. It might be tempting to think, well, what can I do? I'm just one person. But remember those ripples we talked about? Every action, no matter how small, can have a ripple effect. Think about it. Maybe you're inspired to donate to a human rights organization or learn more about what's happening in a conflict zone. Maybe you start speaking up more about injustice, even if it's just in your own community. Maybe you challenge your own biases, your own preconceived notions. Exactly. It's about realizing that peace isn't this abstract concept. It's a choice we make every single day and how we treat each other, how we engage with the world around us. And those everyday choices, they have the power to transform our communities and ultimately the world. And on that note, we'll leave you with a final thought to ponder. Yeah. The 2022 Nobel Peace Prize reminds us that the fight for human rights, for justice, for a world where everyone can live in dignity and security is a fight that belongs to all of us. So the question is, what role will you play? What impact will your ripples make? That's all the time we have for this deep dive. We hope you'll keep these conversations going long after the episode ends. Thanks for listening.